Well, I must admit that I am actually a very pastel coloured. The idea of standing up in front of a crowd is really scary stuff and it's not my favourite position at all. Sitting somewhere in the middle of the back, be between, oh is there a problem here? Between f Phil and Louise is it would be about my favourite position to be. <laughs> Maybe I should come and join you. I could still uh, click from there. But God's in the process of painting us up to be something of a masterpiece. Now, when, when God created the whole world, it was beautiful. It was a glorious picture. But Adam fell and it looks like he put his foot through. God's creation and ever since then thousands upon thousands of generations have been trying to paint the picture to paint out the problem and it doesn't matter how many layers of paint you add to a problem like this it's not going to work so here's the solution after letting us try again and again God paints a new picture the masterpiece itself is Jesus. He is the one who comes into the world as the image of what a real person is supposed to look like and how we are to be like him. So he's the masterpiece. And he comes, this is what makes a difference, full of grace and full of truth. And that marks him out as being someone so uniquely different and special and attractive. But when we come to our text, look at what happens here. Jesus said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and must be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law. And he must be killed. This is not some, whoops, that didn't work out really well. This is the plan. The plan is he must, he must be killed. Not just he must die, but he must actually be killed. Why would it be that Jesus had to be killed? Well, it's because of who he is and what he came to do, what he came to be. He is the sacrificial lamb. And as a lamb had to be killed in order to be sacrificed, a lamb dying in a paddock down, down the top 40 was of no consequence. The lamb had to be brought, hands placed on its head, and the priest kill that sacrifice. That's what made it a sacrifice. Jesus came to be killed because he is paying the wages of sin. And it's confirmed in, in this verse. Christ has appeared once for all. That was all it took. It was just once. At the end of the age, which is where we are now, to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice if he didn't die as a sacrifice it would have been no consequence to us he needed to be our sacrifice to pay for the removal of our sin now there have been lots of people who have sacrificed their lives you go to any cemetery and you'll find you know a military section and those who have sacrificed themselves. It was not a sacrifice for sin. It was a sacrifice for freedom, a sacrifice for peace, a sacrifice for the lives of others. Good and noble sacrifices. But only a sacrifice for this world. The sacrifice that Jesus made was as a sacrifice to deal with our sin. That's what made him unique. No one else can do the sacrifice that he did. So why can he be that sacrifice? 
It's because he comes without sin. Again, that makes him unique. Now, when those uh, were trying to really give Jesus a hard time, look for a reason to kill him, he threw down the gauntlet to them and said, Okay, which of you can truthfully accuse me of a sin? There it is. Come on, let's have it. Any sin, a sin, one sin, any sin. And those who hated him and wanted him to be gone could not find even one thing that they could complain legitimately about him. That's what made him suitable to be a sacrifice. You see, it was the life he lived the sinless life that he lived that prepared him for the death he died. Only as the innocent could he pay the penalty for sin and die as our sacrifice. But that's only part of the story because in that same verse, Jesus not only said that the Son of Man must suffer, must be rejected, must be killed, there's an and. And tucked on to the end of this is the and he must be raised to life. That's part of the must deal of the package deal. <coughs> Looking back on that a couple of weeks after his death, we find these words. God raised Jesus from the dead, which is what Jesus promised would happen, freeing him from the agony of death because it was, and I love this bit, it was actually impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Death had no reason to hold Jesus because it's the wages of sin that's death. And he who had no sin then had no reason to stay dead. And death had no reason, no cause, no logic to hold Jesus in its grasp. So that's why Jesus is able to be raised from the dead. He must be raised as well as must first die. And then we can add to that, Jesus lives forever. Therefore, because he continues beyond death, therefore he is able to save completely those who draw near to God through him since he, again, always lives to intercede for us. This is what's happening. Yes, he must die, but he also must come back to life. And out of that eternal life, he is able to give salvation and keep on dispensing salvation, even though we are thousands of years after the crucifixion. He lives forever and he always lives to intercede on our behalf. And so not only... Was it the life he lived that prepared him for the death he died? But also the death he died as our sacrifice prepared him for the life he lives as the life giver, as the one who's gone beyond sacrifice to be the one who keeps on granting eternal life, abundant life, life that is the life to be lived. And it's all because of what Jesus has done. So hang on to that as the important thing. Now there's something else that we want to add to this. And not only is Jesus the original masterpiece, but the authorised copy of that masterpiece is me. Now do you remember when you were in Paris and you went to the Louvre and there were these forges who were setting up painting grand masters there openly. What was going on? Well, they're actually allowed to do that. And the way that they guard against it not being a forgery is that they're not allowed to paint the uh, original artist's signature uh, on the bottom corner, which is helpful. 
and also the size of the canvas that the copyists use must be at least 20% larger or 20% smaller than the original so that there's no mistaking that, oh, hang on, this is not quite right. It's a different size altogether. But there are hundreds of these people who are allowed into the Louvre and are allowed to make authorised copies. And they do a fabulous job. And you can stand there and pass judgment on whether you think or not they're doing a good job of matching the Grand Masters. They are authorised copyists. And we, you, me, we are the authorised copy of the Grand Masterpiece. That's Jesus. And Jesus said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple, to look like me, to act like me, to be a reflected image of me, must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. And let's just grab this, take up their cross daily. I used to work with some fellows, nice guys, um, Egyptian fellows who were convinced that Jesus was giving fashion advice. And he said, take up your cross daily. And so they all had a little um, gold cross that they wore around their necks. Because that's what Jesus said to do, isn't it? Take up your cross daily. Well, I suspect it was more than just fashion advice that Jesus was handing out. He's talking about death on a cross. Take up your cross because when he spoke those words no one wore little gold crosses as jewelry the cross was only ever a place of death of agonizing terrible suffering death and jesus saying take up your cross and that would have been a scary thing to hear take up your cross every day and follow him I showed you this slide a few weeks back. This is really the heart of the gospel. This is how all this theology is working in a very simple framework. The Father made the Son who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Hit pause for a sec. That's a transformation that's taking place as our sin is transferred from the cross that we take up daily and transferred onto Jesus so that he who knew no sin in thought or word or action or deed or circumstance his purity he takes our sin and then the other half of that transaction, this legal transaction, is that so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The order is important. It happens in that order for a reason. We have to give up our sin in order to get his righteousness. His righteousness is not going to come and dwell with our sin. We need to have repentance first. We need to get rid of our sin, to walk away from our sin, to renounce our sin. And then when we do that, the other half of that same equation is that then his righteousness is added to us. That's the, the action of salvation that takes place. So... That's why we take up our cross daily where we're finding that not only do we get saved as a one-off event, but we keep on cleansing and renewing and refreshing ourselves as we die daily to our sin. It happens like this. Reckon yourselves. Now, th this is uh, terminology that an accountant would, uh, would just warm his heart. Uh, people who love, yeah, crazy people who love maths. 
uh, would would love this sort of word. This is reckon yourselves, do the accounting, do the maths on this, do the calculations on this. This is something that is hard and logical and factual and you can't get wrong. Work it out. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is what's happening. This is taking up our cross daily Reckoning ourselves dead to sin. No, sin has no part in my life. I'm dead to that. And not just am I dead to that, but I'm also alive as Jesus came back to life. So I'm alive to God in Christ. So the life that he now lives prepares me for the death that I die. The life that Jesus now lives in heaven, glorious and is life-giving, giving me his righteousness, is the life that prepares me to die to self, to die to sin, to let go of what I once was and what I once hold dear so that I can move into the new thing that he's got for me. And so Jesus spells it out. Whoever wants to save their life, they're going to lose it. But whoever loses their life for me. Get that? It's for me. It's not that you become a doormat and let other people walk all over you. It's not that you just become self-sacrificing and just do everything for everybody. That doesn't work. It's whoever loses their life for me. It's to become Christ-like. It's to take on board who Jesus is in our life every single day. So we can say, I am crucified with Christ. There's that transaction happening. So that it is no longer I who live, but Christ is living in me. I'm dying to sin, I'm dying to the old, but I'm alive now and I'm alive because it's Jesus' life that's in me, eternal life that's in me, abundant life that's in me, heavenly life that's in me. It's not just me turning over a new leaf every day. This is new life that is flowing into me from Christ. And here's my favorite word. Abide. Just love this word. Abide. Be, be connected, deeply connected and engaged. Abide in me as I also abide in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must abide in the vine. And neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. We're branches. A branch has no life in itself. A branch cannot produce fruit by itself. A branch can do nothing of itself. It's just the conduit between the vine with its life and the fruit that's produced. We are the branches. And it's only when we're abiding that we are fruitful. And so the life that Jesus lives prepares me for the death that I die. And then that death that I die every day prepares me for the life that I live every day. Why do you become a Christian? Not because you might die tonight, but because you might wake up in the morning. You might wake up and have to live a life. Why not live the life of Christ? And then finally, very briefly, we're not going to spend much time doing on this because this is the negative stuff. The clever counterfeit, not the real masterpiece, not even the authorised copy, but a counterfeit, a fraud, is the world. Jesus goes on to say, What good is it if you gain the whole world? What good is it if you've got the biggest house in the suburb? How is that going to help your soul? What good is it if you've got 14 cars parked in the front yard? It 
all you're doing is annoying the neighbors. It's not helping your soul. What good is it to gain the whole world if you're not gaining something on the inside as well? Elsewhere, Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. You can't serve God while you are enslaved to the things of this world. It's one or the other we need to choose. So we could paint you in bold colours. How would you go looking like this? The life the world lives leaves it unprepared for the death that it's going to die. We can paint you up in as many bold colours as you could possibly take. But in the long run, it's not going to get you over the line. And then Jesus wraps up by saying, whoever is ashamed of me in my words, I'll be ashamed of him. There could be nothing worse than that, being ashamed, uh, by having Jesus be ashamed of us. And so the death that the world is going to die leaves it unprepared for the eternity that is going to keep on dying. It's death on death forever. It's not worth it. No matter how boldly we're painted in this world, it's not the colours that is going to make a difference. So... God wants to paint you, repaint you in bold colours. Bold on the inside. You can still look on the outside. But on the inside, he wants us to be vibrantly coloured as we have his life shining in us. Let me pray for us. Our Father, you know our frailty and there are parts of our life that need to die and keep on dying. There are things of who we once were that are not the best. There are things that we used to be, used to say, used to do that are negative and unhelpful, unkind, untrue. Things that are of the world. But we've been forgiven of those. We've renounced those. We've repented of those. We've rejected those. And now we ask that that death that we have died would be replaced with the new life that is Jesus being raised in us every single day. So continue to be born again in us, to come to life in us to transform us so that we step forward into this better place that you've got in mind for us. Thank you for such love that takes us ever forward. So we give to you ourselves afresh in Jesus' name. Amen.